Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I hope you're all doing very well. So I just watched What If episode 9. Let's talk about it. So first of all, I just have to start off this video with a massive, massive apology. I am so, so sorry to all of you guys who are waiting for my review of What If episode 8 that never showed up on my channel. I'm really upset that I let you guys down like that because I promised that I would stick it out and review all of the episodes of What If, but unfortunately last week was just chaos, madness, destruction, and that just really wasn't possible. I'm really, really sorry. Sorry. I'm a bit of a completionist so like the fact that I have missed out one episode is really annoying to me but today we're going to be discussing my thoughts on episode 8 as well as episode 9 the finale of what if and my thoughts on the series overall so hopefully that can kind of make up for it please <laughs> but before we get into all of that good stuff as per usual if you haven't already please be sure to subscribe to my channel and make sure you turn on your notifications so that you can be told when i upload next now without further ado let's get into the finale so yes this past wednesday saw the finale of the first ever mcu animated series what if after nine whole episodes we finally got the conclusion of this season and i have a lot of thoughts Thoughts, as I said before but firstly let's talk about what happened in episode 8 where we were introduced to this post-apocalyptic world where the only survivors were Natasha and Clint and they were trying to find a way to destroy Ultron because as we saw at the end of episode 7 the party Thor episode Ultron had come to invade their world and even though he wasn't in the same world as he was in the party Thor episode he had discovered the multiverse he had discovered the the multiverse a way to destroy not just one world not just one galaxy not just one universe but all of the universes and that was his new uh, motive that was his new kind of mission that he gave himself once he was introduced to the watcher and he broke through the barriers of the multiverse but here in this episode we're introduced to the origin of the problem and that was the world that created Ultron or more specifically the Tony Stark that created Ultron which was in this world now I've been saying for a while now I don't know how many times I need to tell you guys Tony Stark is the biggest villain the MCU has ever had I don't know how many times <laughs> I don't know how many times I need to explain it to you he created Ultron in his attempt to protect the world from all threats forever he created the biggest threat and not just his earth not just his universe but all the earths <laughs> and all the universes like I'm telling you Tony Stark sucks but none of you listen but anyways in episode 8 we see that the only people left in this world to deal with the consequences of Tony's actions are Natasha and Clint and they set about trying to find something that can take Ultron down ultimately settling on Armin Zola <laughs> this kind of computerized Armin Zola that we were introduced to in uh, Captain America the Winter Soldier this time around he is based in these kind of archives um, from the KGB and then we see them travel to this um kind of hydra base in siberia where he is activated and he is planted in an ultron bot to kind of infiltrate it like a virus and that is their kind of hope to try and take down ultron at that time but then fast forward over to the finale obviously that wasn't successful and ultron has managed to invade um other worlds and other universes um subsequently and so ultimately because ultron poses such a big threat to the multiverse we finally see see the watcher break his oath and intervene now he was tempted to intervene in episode 8 when he saw Clint and Natasha going through those files trying to find Zola but after their attempts to take Ultron down failed he was forced to take matters into his own hands and actually fight against Ultron but when he lost he ended up turning to the guardians of the multiverse this collection of the protagonists that we have been following throughout the season and it's in this finale that we finally get to see them come together in this Avengers style union. So first one up we have Captain Carter who of course we were introduced to in episode one of the season. One of the weaker episodes in my opinion because it was basically a replay of Captain America the first Avenger. We didn't really get enough new stuff 
enough to really um, allow us to ingratiate ourselves with the character of Captain Carter. But she was still a very formidable hero in that episode and I'm glad to see more of her in this one. And here we actually see her in a Captain America the Winter Soldier-esque scene, the likes of which we saw in the live action film where Steve is getting ready for this mission um, and he's talking to Natasha and they have this great banter together. Natasha has one of her best hair looks ever. <laughs> like truly one of her best hairstyles in all the franchise and that's like the sleek bob that she had. Oh, 2014 Natasha was unmatched. Unmatched. In fact, all of the cast. <laughs> I still think that Chris Evans as well looked his best in Captain America the Winter Soldier. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But here we have an animated version of 2014 Natasha and like mwah, stunning. The bob works even in animation, okay? And by the way, Natasha Romanoff has been a very important character in the What If series overall. And I'd just like to give Lake Bell, who voices the character, a nice round of applause because I think she's done a great job. At first it was a little bit jarring because, you know, Scarlett, Hanson's voice is just so iconic <laughs> like it's just so memorable okay and recognizable so having someone else voice the character was a little bit of a shock to the system at first but I've become quite comfortable with her voice I associate her voice with the character very well now I feel like she's done a really good job of having the essence of the MCU's Natasha as she was portrayed by Scarlett Johansson but also adding her own kind of flavor to it so it doesn't feel like an imitation so anyways we do have a kind of mirroring of the interaction that we saw between Steve and Natasha at the beginning of Captain America the Winter Soldier take place instead with Peggy um, as Natasha asks her if she's you know been dating anyone there's this Bernard from accounting and Peggy's like nah Bernard nah <laughs> then she jumps off of course without the parachute just as Steve did ready to take on Batroc um, who doesn't look like Batroc in this episode but fine it's Batroc the Leaper except of course her mission ends up being interrupted by the Watcher himself who needs her for a greater purpose. And the similar thing happens with the rest of the characters that we explored uh, throughout the season including of course T'Challa who is Star-Lord and we also have the return of Eric Killmonger here as well as a party Thor that we were introduced to in episode 7. But one character that we see pop up <laughs> in this episode that we weren't actually introduced to in this season was Thamora as people are calling her she's basically like what if Gamora was Thanos and she took down Thanos basically and we didn't get that episode <laughs> like we didn't get I was scrolling through the Disney Plus episodes and I was like did I miss something like did I miss more than one week we did not get that episode in this season now I already mentioned I think in my review of the first episode of the show this season was supposed to have 10 episodes but because of the whole COVID situation unfortunately that was cut down to nine and I believe that what that episode that was missing from this season was the Gamora episode. What if Gamora had uh, taken down Thanos and Tony Stark would have been a part of that episode because he had landed himself in Sakaar. So that would have been a really cool episode to see but unfortunately we didn't get it and so that's why her appearance in the finale seems a little bit jarring because we weren't introduced to the animated version of the character. So the Watcher assembles his team just as Nick Fury did with the Avengers except this time around they are not just fighting a global threat but rather a multiversal threat and so he gathers them in this like kind of pocket dimension that he creates and it basically looks like the pub that Steve and Peggy hung out in in episode one and in Captain America the first Avenger. And here we see the main protagonists of each episode throughout the season interact with one another and I would say that my favorite characters would probably be Thor. Party Thor is just such a riot. I love Party Thor. <laughs> I think Chris Hemsworth is great as this character and even voicing him in this animated series so he really stands out to me. Um, I would also say that I really really love um, Star-Lord T'Challa like he is another favourite he has been since his appearance in episode 2 and like I said whilst I wasn't the biggest fan of the first episode of the series I do still think that Captain Carter is a great addition to this universe so I really enjoyed their interactions with one another um, as they're introduced to the world 
watcher and to strange supreme or dr strange supreme or i don't know his name but we were introduced to this version of stephen strange and i believe episode five and at the very end of the episode we saw him be trapped in this pocket dimension the only thing keeping him from being destroyed just like the rest of his universe and that kind of comes into play at the very end of this episode also which we'll talk about but it turns out that stephen strange is like a very important character <laughs> in this series in the mcu potentially like i can see stephen strange taking on the role of like a tony stark in the mcu from here on out because he is clearly becoming very central and very key to what the mcu is exploring in phase four and onwards and in this episode he proves to be an incredibly powerful ally to the gang providing them with this protection spell that basically acts as a deus ex machina against any real harm <laughs> that could come to them by the hand of ultron who as he mentioned can literally destroy entire universes with just a single thought and then we see the gang come up with a plan to uh, defeat ultron it's all very quickly done just as um has been the case for the previous episodes of this season as i've been saying one of the downfalls of the show is that it just feels so rushed <laughs> really like i do think each of these episodes could have warranted a 40 minute runtime excluding the credits excluding the credits okay as opposed to like the 23 minute runtime that we get um typically for these episodes because it's just not enough time and it feels that way as well so i would say that the whole process of the guardians of the multiverse getting together you know being introduced to one another coming up with a plan and being able to action that plan is all very rushed and we're very much moving forward very quickly to get to the main event which is the battle royale between them and ultron now in terms of ultron himself just to address this because i didn't do a review of episode eight even though i wrote one but um, in my review i can see <laughs> um that one of the things that struck me about ultron in episode eight was just how powerful he is and i remember when age of ultron came out um some of the criticisms that uh, people had for that film is just how depowered ultron felt he felt too much like tony stark um he was a bit too quippy as opposed to being like a genuine threat to the gang and i disagree with that they had to destroy a whole country to defeat him like lest we forget but i could see how some comic book readers would have felt that the ultron in the live action film didn't do the comic book counterpart justice because considering just how powerful he is in this series he is like a thousand times more powerful <laughs> like he is insanely powerful the fact that he was just able to slice thanos in half in last week's episode like truly it just established that he is the big guy whenever you see an old villain be killed by the new villain you know that new villain means business i mean that's exactly what happened at the beginning of avengers infinity war when thanos killed loki like snapped his neck like a twig and so we see a similar thing happening here with ultron just slicing thanos like a prosciutto <laughs> in a meat slicer and that establishes his power that establishes his authority over these multiverses and so when you see him go on this mission to uh, destroy all the multiverses all life it definitely feels like the stakes have been raised but anyways they are able to come up with a plan to defeat ultron using an infinity stone crusher that uh, gamora has again that's all related to her episode which she never actually got and i believe we're going to be getting the episode in season two although i don't know what impact it will have considering we already know the outcome <laughs> she has an infinity stone crusher that she plans on using in order to destroy the infinity stones that ultron has because he has been able to gather all of the infinity stones and that's what he's using to power him to extreme level and the vast majority of this episode is basically the this big battle royale like i said against the guardians of the multiverse and ultron with him quipping and being surprised at how long it's taking him to kill them and them really trying hard to try and find different ways to destroy this incredibly powerful being again doctor strange is a very important part of this he is so so powerful ultron even comes to realize this himself he's like hang on if i kill you <laughs> like, if i take you 
down then everyone goes down okay so there's definitely an element of you know Doctor Strange being the VIP here now whilst the fight starts off in this really abandoned area where no life exists and therefore Ultron wouldn't be attracted to it because Thor has a tendency of attracting negative attention <laughs> as he says himself the gang ends up having to escape to Ultron's universe aka the earth that we saw in episode 8 but just as they escape they release a bunch of zombies that we were of course introduced to in episode six i think it is all these episodes are getting a bit muddled up but they release a ton of these zombies on ultron and you know the other zombies are already an issue they're already a bit of a nuisance but the big one <laughs> the big threat to ultron is of course zombie wonder who makes a reappearance here but unfortunately even zombie wonder isn't enough to deter ultron forever he manages to follow them down to the earth that they escape to and just as t'challa had the soul stone in his hand natasha who um, we were introduced to in episode 8 grabs it out of um, T'Challa's hand because she thinks that they are against her she thinks that they're the bad guys not realizing that they are working on the same side and then ultimately Natasha has the idea of using the virus that she tried to use against Ultron in episode 8 to um, take him down in this episode and so you see her shoot an arrow in honor of Clint um, who died in episode 8 she shot an arrow into Ultron and therefore we saw Armin Zola infiltrate his system and we get a similar scene that we saw in Avengers Age of Ultron where Ultron had infiltrated vision systems that kind of interaction between these um, AIs that took place is a kind of battle that we've never seen before <laughs> with these um, beings that don't actually have physical bodies but just as it looks like Armin Zola is getting comfortable in his new incredibly powerful suit we get the betrayal <laughs> we get the betrayal from Eric Killmonger who's been really quiet throughout this episode okay like notice how I didn't really mention him earlier as one of the characters that really stood out it's because he's been very calculating he's been very quiet throughout the entirety of these interactions he played his part during the fight but clearly he had ulterior motives because the second that he was able to get a hold of Ultron's body he very much did so he was already programming some of the Ultron bots and I like the fact that that kind of tied into his episode where he was working with Tony Stark um, and with Stark technology which he would clearly be um, familiar with from uh, what he worked on in that episode and ultimately I saw the betrayal coming from a mile away because like I said in my review of his episode he was betraying people left right and center and unfortunately the guardians of the multiverse were no exception now just like with Ultron Eric Killmonger in this incredible Incredibly powerful suit is yet another huge threat to the multiverse and so finally the last resort that Doctor Strange comes to is creating a pocket universe to uh, retain Armin Zola and Eric Killmonger inside that's the only way that he can come up with to protect the rest of the multiverse from imminent destruction and he realizes that the goal was never really to win but rather to separate the Infinity Stones and Ultron's body I I will say though just as a little side note that there was a bit of an inconsistency there because earlier on in the episode there is this little gag between Doctor Strange and the Watcher where um, the Watcher is kind of like embarrassed by how incompetent <laughs> how incompetent the Guardians of the Multiverse um, seemingly are at the beginning but then uh, Gamora reveals that she has a device that can crush the Infinity Stones although it turns out it only works on the Infinity Stones in her universe when it's revealed that she has that device the Watcher is like really proud and he's like yeah this is my team and it's like why would he say that if he knew that the plan was meant to fail like if he knew that that device was designed only for the infinity stones in her world and wouldn't be effective uh, for the infinity stones that Ultron has like that doesn't quite make sense. Doctor Strange ends up making the ultimate sacrifice although he himself doesn't see it as much of a sacrifice because he was doomed to return to his pocket dimension anyways after he destroyed his universe so the only difference here is that he has to watch over this other pocket dimension that encapsulates Eric Killmonger and the Infinity Stones and Armin Zola and in the meantime all of the other gang return to their respective worlds and we see the kind of closing of the stories that we were introduced to throughout this season we see Peter Quill and T'Challa interacting and they seem to be fighting alongside each other 
like gangster ego so we see ego be taken down in this universe even though it seems like he was be posing a bigger threat um in his episode but you know fine <laughs> he's just taken down i guess also see peggy carter return to her world albeit a bit reluctantly you know she does play with the idea of going to a different world or a different time so that she could be with steve i'm presuming just as steve did in avengers endgame but the watcher tells her that she has to return because the world needs a captain carter although we see a continuation of her story in an end credits scene where we see the uh what was the suit called the hydra crusher something along those lines um but the suit that steve wore in episode one survived and there is an implication that he survived within the suit as well somehow i don't know how that would work because at least in like the mcu proper he was preserved in ice but fine okay he survived somehow seemingly and so we do see it somewhat of a happy ending on that front for the character um but all of the other characters have to return to their worlds you see party thor going on a date with jane like that's literally just all that he wants to do which is cute but then we have natasha natasha who um is from the post-apocalyptic world that ultron completely destroyed and there's literally no one left behind anymore especially after the death of clint in episode eight she is the most reluctant to return to her world and i guess the watcher figures that because literally no one is left on her world and there is a vacancy for a black widow in another world that he can just do a swapsies <laughs> he can just finesse things a little bit for her and he ends up dropping her off in the worlds where the avengers were assassinated in that episode i think it was episode three again they're all blurring together but um she ends up being dropped in that world right in the middle of i guess the battle of new york or in this version of it she lands right in the middle of the battle and she's able to take loki down just like that which i find generous <laughs> i find that to be generous for the character okay and then at the end of the episode we do get a send off by the watcher himself who again explains just how much these stories mean to him and how he'll do anything to protect them and it's at this point that i mentioned that you know jeffrey wright as the watcher was just a stroke of genius jeffrey wright as the watcher was just mwah, excellent casting he is incredible his voice has the gravity he he just sounds like a god he sounds like a god like being okay i think he did a great job with this role i think it was great seeing the character come closer and closer to these stories become more and more invested in these characters and he started to see them more as just this series of events that he feels very disconnected from because they literally um started getting closer and closer to him so that's it for my thoughts on episodes eight to nine of what if in terms of my thoughts on the series overall i really did enjoy it i really felt like it was a great um animated show just aside from the fact that it is in the mcu i do feel like it's a great show that holds up the only issue that i have with it is of course the runtime as i've been saying some of these episodes feel a little bit rushed and some of these stories feel like they could have been fleshed out a little bit more i also feel like some bigger risks could have been taken in terms terms of giving us different versions of the characters that we've come to know and love in the mcu proper i feel like we could have really gone crazy with it <laughs> and ultimately for the majority of these episodes and these characters that were portrayed in these episodes we didn't get enough of a divergence from the mcu proper and i do think that one way they could do this is kind of by divesting from the live action movies a little bit and instead exploring some comic book um content as we saw for the zombies episode for example it's something that we've never seen in the live action mcu but it's something that they explored in that episode that i think was you know just new and refreshing so i feel like they need to do more of that for the second season um instead of just rehashing some of the live action films that we've seen before because even though it's cool seeing the live action films play out with these animated characters from all across the multiverse i think that the series could do more and could be more if it kind of divested from that. so with all of that being said i'm going to be giving what if season one a seven out of ten so that's it from me now that i told you guys my thoughts on what if episodes eight nine and the series as a whole it's time for you guys to let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments below please be sure to subscribe to catch you videos coming up thank you guys so so much for watching i really really appreciate it and i will see you in the next one bye